Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. And I'm delighted that my guest for this podcast is Tim Wilson, MP, um, who's both not only a member of parliament, but has served as a uh, human rights commissioner and has written a new book called The New Social Contract, which is about liberalism in question. <laughs> Tim, welcome welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Rob. Firstly, what, what, what in your mind is liberalism? Well, my mind liberalism is uh, partly what it isn't and what it is. So if you look at politics, politics is fundamentally about power. Who has power and who gets to exercise it? Now, other political ideologies are focused on empowerment of central authority to achieve centralised objectives. Uh, Fascists are in favour of using centralised political power to impose order. Socialists are in favour of centralising political power uh, to to, uh, impose a greater sense of equity and conformity in society, et cetera, et cetera. Religious fundamentalists in terms of social and moral norms um, according to their standards. Uh, liberalism is the complete reverse. This was a, a topic explored quite extensively by people like Hayek, uh, who argued that essentially liberalism was about the decentralisation of power and therefore the empowerment of the individual and creating the social and legal and political and institutional structures to empower individuals to be able to live out their lives, pursue their dreams and their aspirations and support the evolution of organic institutions like family and community as uh, the crux and the anchor of political, social and economic power in society. I, I, notice, I notice in your book you say that <clears throat> the meaning of modern liberalism depends upon the country. Yes, and, uh, you know, there are different strands of liberalism in different countries based uh, partly on their partisan uh, political movements uh, and also on the foundations or the origins of uh, what liberalism was essentially rebelling against. Uh, of course, in the United Kingdom, uh, liberalism was kind of a radical concept because it was fighting things like hereditary privilege and a, a class-structured society. Um, it went off and joined the socialists, um, which I still find very challenging, or the social democrats uh, in the 20th century in a partisan sense. And today, it's a sort of a left progressive political ideology. In the United States, uh, uh, liberalism um, was very clearly connected to progressive movements in the 19th century, um, which actually got quite closely attached to moralism uh, and wanting to impose different forms of uh, moral order. That's where prohibitionism, for instance, came from, as well as challenging concentrations of economic power, uh, uh, particularly through oil trusts and the like. Australian liberalism has never been like that. Uh, from uh, its modern foundation as a, as a country, um, a modern nation, uh, and even in the colonial era, uh, these experimental ideas of liberalism came with European settlers to this continent uh, and they became a, Australia basically became a great liberal experiment. But it was very clearly anchored to individual empowerment and particularly through things like home ownership or, or what was then really property settlement, but that and that had to be twinned with not just having the rights over property, but the obligation uh, to uh, to use it uh, and uh, continues through the discussions like home ownership today. But it's a society built off the individual has both freedoms and responsibilities. So it's not the same for you as libertarianism? No, libertarianism, uh, I think, is, um, well, firstly, I think is a foreign concept to Australia, period. Um, because we don't have a very deeply set rights-based culture. And uh, I say that as the former Human Rights Commissioner, which uh, was one of the first observations I uh, made when I was appointed to that role. Uh, But in addition to that, there's always been a much greater sense of uh, freedom with responsibility and a sense of justice within Australian society. And uh, libertarianism by its nature is a bit more anarchic. Uh, It uh, has probably a lesser focus on things like redistributive justice and how that can be uh, done within a liberal framework, Uh, whereas liberalism has always understood that if you want uh, a political um, constituency for your ideas and your values, uh, not just in the partisan sense but just in the general sense of a liberal democracy, people have to have a sense of investment and ownership uh, over the society, the economy and the structures that are there to serve them and their empowerment. 
I mean, because liberalism is different in different countries because of historical context, is it primarily therefore a negative reactionary movement rather than something that stands in its own terms? No, liberalism absolutely stands on its own terms and it's a political ideology for people. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that in many cases it has evolved uh, in response to um, challenges or pre-existing orders. So I use the example of the UK where liberalism was very much a political ideology against um, established interests and power and particularly hereditary uh, privilege. Whereas in Australia, when European settlers arrived, um, rightly or wrongly, they saw the this new continent as a blank canvas. And we need to acknowledge that you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders were absolutely there before them, but the ideas that came with them created the foundation really for the establishment of a great liberal experiment. And in fact, one of the things that has always really defined Australian liberalism is that it's a classless based political ideology. It's designed to empower individuals and every person to be able to go out and realise and live their full ambition. So it's for people. Have you always held this as your own personal political philosophy or have you come to it? So I, I've always been a liberal in the classical sense, but uh, I'm very candid, you know, during the um, years when I was Human Rights Commissioner, I spent a lot of time engaging with uh, Australians um, of all walks of life. One of the things about being in Parliament or any type of public office, including Human Rights Commissioners, you're exposed to the full complexity of humanity. And so sometimes the sharper edges of what you might believe in might progressively be rounded off as you find that marriage in that space between ideas and the lived human experience. And also to really recognise the um, incredible uh, celebration that is the success of our country. Now, no one is trying to pretend that it uh, doesn't have imperfections. It does. But uh, that what makes so much of our country successful is a, an, a uniquely modern Australian liberalism that is anchored in the empowerment of individuals as a foundation for the success of citizens, communities and country. I mean, you, you worked with the IPA before you took, took, took your office. You, mm -hmm. what, were you a hard-line liberal then and became more moderate <laughs> from being... No, no, I, being this is the thing I... Uh, a commissioner. Uh, no, this is one of the um, errors is suggesting that what I'm putting forward is more moderate. It's not. It's an understanding about the unique marriage of Australian liberalism. And so uh, in my uh, e uh, my years prior to being Human Rights Commissioner, I solely operated in the world of ideas. And so, of course, you know, it's not just a grand contest, but, of course, it means that there are sometimes some sharper edges because you don't have to confront the challenges or the realities uh, of, uh, of those sharp corners um, and uh, the impact can have on people's lives. When you spend a lot of time as Human Rights Commissioner, you're constantly confronted with the sharp um, corners and the consequences of doing so. And what it made me, um, I guess, more comfortable with was the, uh, the the sense of balance that exists at the heart of Australian liberalism, which um, finds a way to channel people's aspirations for the success of themselves and the country and that sense of responsibility. It's not just, of course, about rights and freedoms, it also has to be about responsibility to each other as well. I notice in your book you certainly highlight Menzies as a good guiding light in your view. You, you believe he certainly got it right on this matter. Yes. Well, I think what Menzies understood was, again, that uh, that inherent dimension of liberalism which connects directly to people and the Australian aspiration uh, for the success of a country made up of today 25 million citizens. And what he explicitly understood was that liberalism was firstly a political ideology for people. He understood that it was to be uh, a agenda setting progressive movement rather than one that simply sought to defend the past or institutions in isolation. And he did so because he saw as the best vehicle to, uh, uh, to set the direction of the country. Um, when you simply uh, uh, stick to uh, the existing order or the status quo, um, and defend that without any sense of uh, projection of where you want the country to go, you'll ultimately only be dragged off into the alternatives of the social democratic tradition. He understood that our deference always has to be towards uh, individuals, but there was a role for government. Uh, but when, when we always start from a default position of how can individuals and uh, working collaboratively and voluntarily achieve things best, 
but also I, that that one of the critical principles that's sitting behind that is if you want citizens and uh, and families to provide for the environment of organic institutions and the nation's success, uh, it comes from having investment in the country and the nation, principally through home ownership. I, I notice you have distinction here between, you say you distinguish between liberalism for individuals and liberalism for individualism. That's the distinction you're trying to draw here. That was it. You said yeah. that's what Menzies observed. Yes, no, that's right. I mean, he, he wasn't after an individualistic liberalism. There's a distinct understanding of the importance of mutualism. And uh, there are other people who have written about this before, like a, a former Attorney General George Brandis wrote a paper back in the mid-'80s saying that one of the key defining uh, uh, traditions of Australian liberalism was our sense of responsibility to each other and that we all had, if we wanted to live in a good society and a society that progressed where everybody moved forward together, we had a responsibility to each other to achieve each other's success, but that our individual, our, each other's success was achieved through as many individuals being able to stand on their own two feet as possible so they can help others who can't do so for themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna call you moderate, but I could call you nuanced, <laughs> that understanding. Well, no, I don't think it is actually. I think it's uh, well, it's, I think balanced. It's, it's it's different from the kind of thing one often hears, which is basically liberalism equals laissez-faire individualism. You're saying that's definitely not what it means. Uh, well, no, I'm not saying it's, it, that there's a component of that. But Menzies talked about this specifically um, about how uh, the limit limitations of laissez-faire uh, approach to liberalism, where uh, it had, um, particularly in the, uh, the later parts of the 18th century and early 19th century, hadn't created a society where everybody had a sense of mutual investment. Uh, and that's what he specifically um, said he was against. Now, I'm probably a bit more laissez-faire than, uh, than Menzies was, uh, but it doesn't come without a sense of responsibility. So what to my you're saying is there's both the it's what's good for individuals, but that will involve a sense of mutuality and, and, and a, a stake in the society. Both are important. Yeah, that's right. And, it, and it's part of a, and that, that sense of mutual responsibility builds a sense of um, civil um, conduct between people. Now, you start your book with the rather alarming, for some, statement that liberalism is missing in action today. And in fact, your book, your book seems to suggest that the quality of debate in this matter is, is poor, to, just, to say the least. Yeah, well, I guess um, what I've seen is a drift of public discussion uh, around a lot of um, issues where uh, we're seeing the centre-right drift not towards an idea about what liberalism is, but increasingly towards conservatism. And the way I sort of outline my, my critique of conservatism is that, firstly, it's not, it's not an, an ide a forward-looking ideology. Um, really, it's like getting into a car. Conservatism is putting your foot in a brake. Um, progressivism is putting your foot on the accelerator. Now, defining yourself by either the extent to which you want to stop a car or speed up a car doesn't make a lot of sense um, because it will only lead you either to others taking over from you or you're running, going at such a reckless speed that uh, you'll crash into others. What you should define yourself by is where you want to go. And that, in the Australian tradition anyway, has mostly been a social democratic path or a liberal democratic path. And there just aren't a lot of voices these days arguing for liberal democracy and the principles because too many people have fallen for a nativist um, sort of conservative populism, which has been propagated from the United States, which is quite foreign to Australian audiences. And the problem with going down that path is not just that you end up uh, slamming your foot on the brake, but that invariably the forces of your political opponents will drag you towards their objective, even if it's at a slower pace. The objective of liberalism is not to slowly become social democrats, it's to define an alternative. This is Liberalism in Question. I'm Rob Forsyth and my guest today is Tim Wilson. And we're discussing some issues of liberalism, particularly arising from his new book, The, so the New Social Contract. Tim, am I right, therefore, liberalism is missing in action. It's not the fault of the Social Democrats winning. It's the fault of those, if I could use a broad phrase, on the right or right, right-ish area having lost some clarity. I think it's about losing clarity, but it's also about losing a sense of perspective about where society's heading. Um, if you, unless you want to be a, um, uh, a reactionary where you want to recreate society, um, you have to start from a, an understanding and a respect of where people are. 
and what um, their attitudes are towards creating a society uh, that uh, is inclusive and respectful of everybody. And this is where I go back to Menzies. I think one of the, the, the um, uh, critical things that he observed about Australian liberalism is not just that it's about a mutualism towards others, but that it was to create a classless society. And increasingly, I see people on the centre right arguing why they want special types of privileges for themselves or their uh, pseudo identity groups, when in fact, that's anathema to the liberal tradition. Uh, and what you actually want is everybody being equal and that the argument when in doubt should be to create a good society, you need one based on tolerance and mutual respect and that nobody gets any special favours. Well, let me ask you about what's gone wrong. Can I ask you particularly the role of neoliberalism in, uh, and uh, it, it really, uh, you say it's given liberalism a bad name. And well, I don't say that. I just say that it has a, it's, it's reached its peak of its contribution. That's very nicely put. <laughs> but has it given liberals a bad name? That is, is there a sense in which some of the unintended consequences of, you call it, releasing the assets have led to a kind of weariness with the talk of individualism or liberalism and therefore you find yourself more, more alone voice or else it's hollowed out the very meaning of liberalism? Well, I, I don't think it's hollowed out the meaning of liberalism. I think what we had was a post Second World War consensus, which led to great inefficiency uh, in society and led to a huge accumulation of equity. And it didn't matter what it was. It was um, social equity, um, institutional equity, um, financial equity, capital equity, et cetera. And what neoliberalism was focused on was how do you make or how do you release a lot of this equity to actually build a more competitive society and one that's moved away from being collectivist to being more towards individualist. I guess what I would say is that it probably reached its peak um, and has done about as much as it can and now uh, there's a need to focus on how to rebuild that sense of equity and find a better sense of balance between the individual and the collective. Um, and, you know, this is not a unique observation just to me. This is uh, uh, Yuval Levin in the United States at the American Enterprise Institute recently wrote a book on similar themes um, called a Time to Build recognising that that sense of rebalance is necessary. It's it's a common theme between uh, works like uh, those by Charles Murray from the, I think he's also from the American Enterprise Institute, um, looking at some of the problems uh, in different parts of society in America to keep it cohesive. Because if you want a sustainable society, you can't have people living in islands. You've got to have that understanding about responsibility to others and also making sure uh, that everybody is broadly moving forward together and not allowing people to be left behind. I notice you write that you say neoliberalism prioritised freedom over justice, but only with renewed liberal outlook that is leaves neoliberalism behind can we address contemporary challenges and rebuild liberalism's social licence, implying that liberalism in a sense has to kind of reclaim its social licence. Yeah, well, it does, because um, I, what I point out in the book is there are some big structural balances that have um, we've allowed to create, which I think has undermined people's sense of confidence uh, in our institutions and in our existing sort of broadly liberal economic order. And, uh, and I make the point particularly around how we do things like tax, where we preference uh, the uh, the income and growth of capital, so people who have investments and get a preferential arrangement off labour and how that creates a distinction between those who obviously have assets but primarily older people who therefore get the benefit from them versus younger people who only have their physical and intellectual labour to sell. And if they're paying more for the cost of society uh, and ha carrying higher tax burdens as a consequence, it doesn't suggest to young people, and this is what we're seeing uh, in most Western liberal democracies, they think the existing social and political order works for them. So we have to address it. And they're finding solutions, not in a revived liberalism, but in social democracy. No, no, it's through or, liberal or, democracy, because what I'm arguing... No, no, I mean, I mean it is, are, are, they, are they not then leading? Oh. I, I know it's typical. When, when you're young, you're a socialist. When you're older, you're, you're not. I know that famous George Bernard Shaw, I think it was, said that. But you're suggesting yes. that liberalism has is got a, a bit of a battle at the moment because because of that lack of in, sense of belonging, people are getting yes, solutions, well, which you think are actually not solutions, but are corporatist. 
Well, what, what, they're actually, what they're being sold is the lie that socialism always is, that uh, that all they can have every bit of their free lunch um, and uh, at every point and have their cake and eat it too. But if Liberals aren't out there prosecuting and addressing the issues that younger people in Australia at the age of 18 to 35 is the largest voting demographic in the country, if they're not engaged in these issues and they're not focusing on what young Australians want, then they can't be surprised that they'll be sold or, or, or buy the product that the uh, socialist snake oil salesmen sell them. Um, and so my my call to arms is for Liberals to look at the issues that young people are interested in, um, to take them seriously, and because actually what they do is provide a really good framework for making the argument for Liberal reform, particularly around things like tax, uh, around home ownership, uh, and around creating an environment that encourages jobs and responsibility uh, as the foundation for people's success. That's very interesting. I've never thought of it quite that, like that. Um, almost not quite Marxist, but you're saying get the economics right, you might get the, the thinking can go as well, that the, 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 the concrete well, social conditions are affecting how people are feeling or thinking about their place in society. Yeah, well, yes, and uh, and if you just look at the United States or the UK where you see uh, uh, Bernie Sanders or Jeremy Corbyn drew most of their support from people under the age of 35. Now, they were both unreconstructed socialist um, anachronisms from the Cold War. It obviously wasn't their youthfulness that became the attraction for young people to vote for them. It was the ideas. And, of course, immediately behind people like Bernie Sanders, you've got... Uh, uh, AOC, who represents similar values and similar aspirations. So there's obviously something about the ideas that they're prosecuting and certainly the issues they're prosecuting that attract people and young people. So um, don't, 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 don't allow them to get away with dealing with the issues. Come up with the alternative liberal agenda of how you'll address those to give young people an alternate pathway. One common explanation for that phenomenon is not the one that you've raised, but this is the uh, the culture war explanation, that this is, uh, you know, the neo-Marxists, the, crit the critical theory people in the universities and schools that have led to this. Do you give any credence to that, to that um, analysis? In short, no, not really, um, because there are two factors that basically inform people's decision-making or their perception. Most people, uh, you know, yeah, their perspective on the world is informed by their own lived experience more so than the formality of education. And um, and I think one of the biggest problems that uh, those on the broadly centre-right have, and particularly those in the liberal tradition, is truthfully they're just not even talking about the issues that a lot of young people are interested in. You know, you go, and I use the example of looking through the manifestos of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn, um, as indicative of it, they spend a lot of time talking about climate change, home ownership, education costs, uh, uh, and uh, and the like, and and jobs, of course, for for young people. But then, if you look at the alternatives at uh, similar elections of the alternative political parties, you just don't see those core themes as being the priority of what they're selling. In fact, you see things that are largely being sold to baby boomers, and we, of course saw that in our last election where one of the key and critical issues on the Liberal National side was around um, an obscure tax credit that only affected self-managed um, uh, self super, uh, super fund annuance. Now, I'm not, I, I was critical to that debate, um, but it shows you that you've got to build up the ammunition on all sides of the spectrum to make the argument to be politically attractive for That's the coming large generation. So you think that uh, those wishing to push forward liberalism, need to take the agendas clear but give different answers rather than ignore the agendas, which is commonly done. That's right. And that's and that's critically what Menzies understood, and I keep coming back to him because I think he's a scion in this regard, is that he understood that if you wanted to be politically attractive, and not just in the partisan sense but in the value sense, uh, that you had to have a constituency who could see how their lives are lived through your values. And that's what liberalism at its best does it addresses the issues that confront people. It doesn't try and uh, recreate the circumstances uh, for uh, to try and change people to fit the circumstances. I, I want to go to Menzies because uh, there's a fascinating quote uh, in your book which, which in a sense shows the gulf between his day and ours. And I want to ask about this. He said at, at one point, quote, we're all Australians of common race, language, literature, traditions and religious faith. 
Now, that may not have been true then. I, I want to come back to the Indigenous question in a moment. It's certainly not true now. Yes. It was not, we're not common race, I guess, language, sort of literature, no traditions. Um, didn't Menzies' consensus depend upon a kind of, not being critical, a kind of monocultural view of the society? How do things work with a, well, a, a much more multicultural society? Without so that? I don't think... I actually don't think so. I think uh, I think that did around some aspects of cultural norms and values uh, uh, that uh, I do think, you know, obviously having a more homogenous culture makes it more achievable. But one of the great things about liberalism, and I make this point in the book, is that it's not actually a political ideology that's overly anchored to one um, ethno tradition. Uh, in fact, it's quite adaptable to just about every society if you build up and, and that's what's always been its appeal, it's its universalness. Um, and every country has a universal liberal tradition around the equal dignity of people and uh, the equal tolerance and uh, respect for all people and their lives and their opportunity to achieve um, and their enterprise. So I think, uh, I think it's entirely adaptable even in an increasingly multiracial or multicultural society. And then the, um, the salve to the problems that we're facing are equally universal. The idea that we can have a generation, um, no matter what their ethnic or religious background, own their own home, own their own success, and own their own future, and show tolerance and responsibility towards their fellow citizens. I don't think that's countercultural to any society if um, once you make the appeal of those values and you provide a good framework for them to implement in practice. Um, can I just, could, could go particularly to the question of Menzies' phrase, we have of common race? And raise the question of, of the of the indigenous questions that are around, and and you, you're aware of them. I think it was Stan Grant drew attention to the fact that, in favour of he wants a voice to Parliament, that these issues can't be properly resolved unless we deal with the liberal nature of Australian society and deal with that. Is there not a problem here that, as you say, social contract theory has never been absent in Australian society, but the one group who've never, as it were, had the freedom to, to sign up to the social contract have been the indigenous people of this land and therefore their lack of involvement slightly puts a question mark over the whole social contract. It almost delegitimizes our society. And this is what's deeply involved in this great bad debate about what's the way forward. What, what's a proper liberal solution um, approach to this difficult question of, in, of, of indigenous relationship to the, cult, to the dominant society? Well, I don't think it delegitimises the social contract, but it addresses a fundamental problem, which is that it was an ignored part of the progress of our, our nation. So I said uh, right from the outset that one of the, the critical things about Australian liberalism was that a society moves forward together. And the truth is uh, that hasn't been what's happened with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And now we're, for want of a better phrase, trying to find a way to play catch up. Now, I think that's enormously challenging to do so, but I think uh, more than anything else, what it actually requires is uh, the governmental institutions to allow and, and the social and cultural institutions to allow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to organise for themselves and create self-supporting infrastructure to advance their own interests, because that's ultimately what we want for the rest of the country is citizens to come together to form families and communities, the success uh, of the nation. And what we've done by both leaving our original and Torres Strait Islanders behind, but also, frankly, destroying much of the culture and the traditions and the social structures that existed before European settlement. There's a massive rebuilding exercise uh, to go on. And so okay. I think it's about starting with the very basis of how do we get some degree of order to enable Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders to be, succeed? I, I take that point. Uh, I was... I I was pushing back even to a more deep, perhaps a more fundamental question, in that um, the some people, the Indigenous people had Australian citizenship, as it were, thrust upon them. They were dispossessed. They weren't asked. Yep. Um, there's a sense in which they haven't consented in any, any real sense except by giving in to this liberal society. And that's what I meant by delegitimising, that the Australian settlement... Um, has it within it an element of compulsion, which which is a challenge to your liberal idea that everybody is to be equal and individuals are all, we're not to make distinctions between people. Here's a group, in theory anyway, who are different from the rest of us because they have never been, in a sense, part of 
it was imposed upon them. I'm trying to put this, I'm, I'm not sure I'm being clear, but yeah. I'm trying to, no, no, there's no, a, no, a genuine think... issue here. But I think Stan, whether his answer's right, I don't know. He was right to draw attention that we need a liberal solution to this problem because Australia is actually basically a deeper viewpoint here, yeah? very deeply liberal in many of its mores. Yeah, oh, Dan, I don't disagree with, um, with that sort of broad analysis. And I think that's one of the stains on our history as a country, um, which is that uh, uh, at the time uh, there wasn't that sense of um, uh, inclusiveness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, and I don't want to get into a long debate about that yeah. history, but yeah. I, I think it's, it's enormously problematic. Um, so so would, you be, um, would you be in favour of special rights for Indigenous people within the society, which is what's being asked for? or merely just catch them up so that up the rest of us. There's two fundamental visions here. One is Indigenous people have some inherent differentness that needs to be respected even to this day, or no, the problem is they've been left behind and need to catch up. But in principle, they're the same as the rest of us. Which way do you come I, down on that division? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a fair analysis, actually, because I, right. think what, I think one of the tensions is that there is an indigeneity um, which exists for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, where they have different or separate cultural traditions um, to the rest of the Australian community. Um, but there are many subsections of the community who have different cultural traditions. And so I, I think we have a responsibility as a country to celebrate those traditions, um, languages um, and arts as part of uh, uh, an incorporation into the mainstream of our country. But I don't think Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are asking for something it's for special rights or special privileges. I think they're asking for respect. I think they're asking for the freedom to take responsibility for themselves and for there to be a proper accommodation into the body politic and so, a social order of the country, which has been denied in the past. And I think there is a need to um, create a process and a, and, uh, and a respect for that to happen because it's only when we move together as a whole nation and move forward together as a whole nation that we achieve the full success of everything this country can promise. My guest is Tim Wilson. This is Liberalism in Question. I'm Rob Forsyth, and uh, we're coming to the end of our conversation, I'm sorry to say. Tim, you, you, you made the comment about liberalism being a kind of uni universal, in some way, in principle universal, uh, but it, it has been argued more and more recently that, in fact, it's not universal. It's a contingent phenomenon based upon certain pro products of the Western world and Western civilization, European Western civilization, and that it's not universal. And that in fact, some of the mistakes that have been made in the past when the Americans, for example, invaded Iraq was if you take away all this oppression, the natural liberalism will be there left underneath. This turns out to be a fall off mistake. It's not natural in that sense, is it? It's a distinctly historical and contingent phenomenon, even if it is to be preferred. Do you agree with that analysis? Well, sort of is the answer. The um, uh, liberalism is all, and, and you can't separate out a political ideology from the context in which uh, it, it finds itself. So when I said explicitly at the start uh, that liberalism in the United Kingdom was fighting class hereditary privilege, that's because that was the circumstance it fell into. The thing that makes Australian liberalism unique, as I outlined when it arrived um, in Australia with the first settlers, uh, is that it, um, uh, if we accept the sort of um, ignoring that occurred of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as being full investors in society, European settlers saw it as a blank canvas, which is what makes our liberalism, I think, unique. Now, if you go into a country and you try and transpose any um, political system without uh, a full respect for the pre-existing traditions, norms, institutions and structures, you'll find it unsuccessful. But if, it, if it's allowed to organically develop through people, um, through a sense of universality about the dignity of all people, it will eventually confront and want to challenge some of the uh, structures in society that create class privilege or class interests against um, a, a, a classless society, which is you know, one of the key aspirations because it focuses on how to empower individuals rather than centralised authority. Let me let me close with this question. Um, are you optimistic about liberalism? Yes, I'm very optimistic about liberalism because uh, over hundreds of years, um, many political, socio-political movements and political ideologies have come, been tried and tested and have all failed except for liberalism because in the end, it's a sustainable political ideology built on that sense of individual empowerment. And one of the things uh, we're, we're confronting now is uh, the extent to which everybody through technology is being empowered in a way they haven't in the past. And so I think 
um, people's sense of freedom and responsibility and uh, pursuit of justice is coming to the fore. Um, the most important thing is to never lose sight of uh, the, the importance of the sense of responsibility we have to each other um, and, uh, and to make sure that liberalism uh, keeps that sense of tolerance and respect. I think I see that is the big challenge today where you get increasingly radical um, uh, uh, people who use the liberal moniker of liberalism who um, in pursuit of tolerance become intolerant themselves um, without understanding that uh, a truly open society has to respect everybody's individuality. Tim Wilson, thank you very much. This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening. Thank you.